Okay, and uh, uh, in the outline again, I mentioned basically the reading material. So if you see the biochemistry and biophysics, typically by themselves are actually independent disciplines. Okay, one can really spend a lot of time and that's the case of teaching either biochemistry alone or biophysics alone. Uh, but here it's only kind of a basic uh, course. This is not an advanced course. So we try to cover only very basic things, okay, kind of most mostly generalized things rather than too advanced uh, details of any specific uh, topic. And uh, more or less, you can really follow any basic uh, uh, textbooks like biochemistry, Leninger, uh, uh, are uh, basically uh, so what are the things the books I suggested? Okay, I'll try to share the PowerPoint slide. So let me share screen. Okay, so I'm sharing screen. Okay, everyone can see my screen. Okay, uh, so these are the four books: Leninger. The basic biochemistry book. Uh, I like actually this uh, mostly physics oriented book, Molecular and Cell Biophysics by uh, Mayer Jackson. This is basically mostly written by physicists. So it, we actually see mostly the quantitative version of uh, uh, biology. Okay, you can call biophysics. And I like these two other books also. Okay, book number two and four. So book number two is Molecular Biology of the Cell by Albert. It's again written by biologists really comes mostly from the cell biology point of view and the latest book uh, the molecules of uh, life by korean Concordi and Bemer. this is an excellent book uh, a little bit costly though okay uh, but it covers actually to the latest topics okay almost like single molecule experiments which we actually do in our lab to that level uh, from the basics onwards you know all these books are actually uh, you can follow any one book more or less it's fine but if I'm covering any specific topic, okay, which is exclusively from a uh, textbook, then actually I mention which book actually I'm talking about. For example, when I try to talk about uh, protein structure, Felix formation, and the quantification of how exactly helices are really formed from individual sequences, you know. Uh, so then I typically follow Mayer Jackson. And uh, uh, for example, like five value analysis uh, where the quantitative expressions are suppressed uh, from the, uh, the Mayer Jackson or uh, polymer physics, you know, where uh, you actually talk uh, the physical properties of polymers from the uh, mathematical point of view, where you try to derive end to end length, uh, things like that, then actually you follow Jackson. Uh, otherwise, when it comes to really maybe important specialized topics, then I mention uh, this Monuments of Life book by Korean. But otherwise, mostly I think uh, the Leninger book is good enough uh, basically to understand what actually I'm talking about in the course. Okay, so I presume because now uh, we are at home and uh, maybe some of you already have access to textbooks, maybe Leninger and things like that. But otherwise, I have a soft copy. Okay, which I can uh, share with you in a quick edition. So fantastic uh, online PDF free file. <laughs> so which I can forward it to Atya and uh, uh, Sindran. So uh, you can, they can actually share with you and uh, that will be helpful. And other thing is that, so I add, uh, so I, I'd like to create a WhatsApp group, okay. So I'm sure you already have groups maybe along with JD uh, for some reason. So what we can do is that we can actually forward all those numbers to Aditya so we can add uh, that. So that anything related to the course, you know, maybe changing the timings or maybe sometimes classes uh, not happening or okay, are extra classes being taken, then we can actually follow. And also any interesting information related to the course or related to even biophysics and biochemistry, we can actually share. Okay, so uh, I think more or less uh, uh, that's the course about the course ah, uh, evaluation. Okay, I think most of you are crediting, so uh, it's going to carry uh, four credits. Okay, uh, basic course is semester long course. So now we typically it's supposed to be 30 contact hours, but typically our courses are much more than 30 hours because within 30 hours, it's hardly we learn anything. So typically, it's 10 months. 
and evaluation is going to be by uh, based on assignments okay so we'll give time time assignments then there will be deadlines okay so you submit within the deadlines of course uh, you carry all the marks uh, depending on what you answer in this but if the assignments are submitted by late okay every extra day there is a delay you will the marks will be reduced by 10% so you can imagine like after a week <laughs> it's as good as you will have to give you submit the assignment <laughs> okay so be careful but you'll get enough time it's not that i give assignment today and then you have to submit it tomorrow okay and uh, uh, i'd like to have a mix of exam because assignments are basically take home assignments right so you actually read the material and then you answer when uh, you have time and then finally you submit uh, a scanned copy uh, Okay, so because that's the only way now we can really see your assignments. Scan copy uh, in a single PDF document, uh, possibly. Then we can open and then see, and then evaluate that. And I'd like to have basically two closed book exams. So one somewhere in the uh, mid set, halfway through the course, uh, and one uh, final exam. Okay, so roughly assignments most probably I'm thinking about so forty percent. Okay. And uh, mix some about mix them about uh, another twenty percent, and then the final exam, uh, which covers the entire semester, about forty uh, percent. Okay, so that will be like hundred percent evaluation. Okay, so so far any questions of Metra? Uh, how exactly we are going to conduct this course? Any questions you can uh, ask now. Okay, so okay, if you uh, you can ask the question anytime during the lecture, no problem. Uh, otherwise, you can post uh, questions in the chat box, but I will not be able to really see constantly the chat box. And maybe Aditya and Simran they can just let me know uh, if you have any questions. So uh, as far as now, any questions you have? Uh, everything is okay. So you can hear my voice uh, clearly, right? Because I think this is a kind of uh, Yes, yeah. Okay, so if there are uh, no questions, uh, so we'll start the course. Yes, someone has asked. Someone. Yes, Gunjan Gusai. Ah, uh, Gunjan, yeah. Voice is, voice is kind of echoing, so the clarity is compromised at some point. Voice is echoing. Okay. So is it that uh, you know, you are away from the uh, laptop? So okay. uh, so I can. Okay, so how about now? Because more or less I'm going to stand here. I'm going to write. Maybe I'm going to move around here and here. Is it echoing now also? Munya? Is it clear? Yes, sir. Uh, I was having a problem at some point due to the echoing of the voice. Otherwise, the blackboard and everything is. Okay, uh, sometime. Okay, let, let's see. We'll go along and then see that. Is it, uh, is it the same? Everyone is. The, having the same problem or only Bunyan? Yes, sir, me too, having the same problem. Little bit of echo, Arjit and Sanjeev? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir, some echoing is occurring. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, is it possible that you guys. Uh, no, I have my mic. Okay, yours is muted right there. Because that's what it is. So, uh, from next time, we can bring my microphone. Microphone? Yeah. Okay. It will be better. Okay, so that is, okay. So next time we'll see that maybe I'll uh, see that I don't know maybe you we can put on a microphone. Yeah. Then we'll see. Uh, otherwise, I think today maybe we'll go along and we'll see that if it is really uh, not good. Then we have to think about something else. But, uh, uh, but you can understand, right? I know there's a core problem, but still it's, it's audible. Uh, it, it, it's okay, right? You can understand. Yeah, it's not excellent. Maybe a little echo, but otherwise it's understandable. Right? Okay, I think so. Okay. Sir, for people inside the campus, are we uh -huh. allowed to physically go and attend the classes? Oh, yeah, 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 you can. Now, uh, you see, right now, Aditya and Simran are in ATAT. So, as long as you leave one seat in between, okay, one row in between, you can actually, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Yeah, it's a thing. So, people who are on campus, uh, they can come and attend. That also reduces the uh, load. And uh, second thing is that we are actually recording uh, these lectures. So uh, we, we try to have recording for every lecture so that you can actually hear uh, later if it is required, if you want to feel, uh, yeah. if it is not really 
uh, understandable during the lecture. But later, let's see if you want the application. Uh, then you can actually have these uh, lectures aware. Okay, uh, uh, people are on campus. Yes, you're welcome. You're allowed to uh, uh, come to the uh, lecture room. As long as you wear mask and uh, maintain social distancing, it's fine. Uh, only thing is, if I cannot wear mask, then it would be very difficult for me to speak for one hour. Okay. Uh, okay, so welcome once again. Uh, so this is a basic course. So typically what is biochemistry and uh, biophysics? Okay, so if you have to define uh, biochemistry and biophysics. Okay, so, so in simple form, so one can define is, is basically understanding living organisms are uh, the processes which occur in living organisms. And in terms of uh, the case point of view, so you have to see basically uh, structure, okay, organization, okay, and uh, function. Okay, and molecular. Okay, so the structure of living systems, what are they made up of? Okay, and uh, whatever they are made up of, how those things are organized. Okay, so in three dimensional space, and then how that gives rise to a function. Okay. And all these things at molecular level. Okay, from the molecular level point of view, you want to be really things. So biochemistry is typically talks about the chemical uh, input or chemical nature of this process, chemical nature of the structure, how chemically they are organized, what are the interactions, and how these interactions give rise to uh, the functional output, which is important for the uh, uh, organism. And the biophysics part is this application of uh, application of physical tools. Okay, on uh, models to These processes. Okay, but all of this for living systems are like. Okay, so all of living systems. Sir, how exactly? It's yes? not properly visible, sir. It's not properly visible. No, sir. Can you please maximize the letters or something? Yes. Ah, no, stop the screen. Oh, okay, okay. Ah, so uh, th there are two ways to do this. Okay, so uh, so right now you're seeing my PowerPoint, right? Yes. Okay. So is there a way actually you toggle between, for example, like my uh, video and this? So you know you can actually maximize. Yeah. So there is some option called pin video, right? Okay. So if you see pin video. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, now it can. Uh, okay. So if you see yeah. pin video, so then you can see uh, what's coming through my video. But if you see the screen share, then you see what's happening. Okay. So I think we, now you should be able to do this toggle. Let's say when I'm, I'm writing something on the board, so you should be able to toggle to that. Yes. Whenever I say that, let's say, uh, look at this picture on the PowerPoint slides, then you should be able to uh, see that. I think all of you should be able to work around that, right? Is, is uh, what I'm saying is clear to you? Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so this biochemistry and biophysics is for the structural organization and function at the molecular level of all, all the processes which occur in living system. And then use physical models, methods, tools, okay, to understand living systems. 
Okay, so this brings to our first question what is life? What is life? Uh, what is when you say something is real? Okay, or something is not real? Okay, anyone wants to say something? How do we say something is real or not? When do you say something is real, something is not real? Okay, especially in the COVID pandemic life, we need to really define these terms even more accurate. Okay, when do we say something is real or something is not real? How do we characterize? So, what are the aspects which we think about when we say or uh, define uh, something is real? Okay, anyone wants to? It's going to be interactive. Okay, of course. So, if you want some. Okay, anyone wants to say something? How do we? Sir, uh, there should be metabolism of. Metabolism. Some metabolism for life, living. Okay. Um, metabolism. Okay. So, what is metabolism? Uh, like all the processes of. Uh, okay, it's a very broad word. Yes. Okay. For example, like conversion of food into yes, right? yes. Uh, but food into energy, uh, we can actually do in weeks. So that, that, that's the, the point I'm going to come in. Okay, so if you define a properly metabolism, is basically if you have uh, the food source, energy source. Okay, converting that into products in the glucose, you get actually energy, right? But that we can do as a chemist, you know, as a chemist, you know, in a test tube, right? You can do these reactions in a test tube. But then, you know, do you call that life? Is it a living system? So there is some kind of programmed growth associated with life and then decay. Some. Okay, growth and decay. Growth and relation are Okay, so growth and decay. Also, they are self sustainable in forms of deriving energy and reproducing themselves. Okay, uh, utilizing energy is self, self sustainably and reproducing themselves. By using energy and reproduction again leading to growth. Okay. Utilizing so, energy and reproduction. Life is respiration. If uh, respiration not occur then life don't life it is uh, uh, not living system. Respiration, okay. Uh, but any of these things, you know, so you are aware, of course, they occur in living systems. But any of these processes can be done in test tube as well. That's still what you do. For example, a reaction, okay, as a respiration reaction, okay. So where you have molecules are involved, you know, enzymes are involved. So, but if we have all these things, okay, in, in test tube, in principle, you replicate what's happening inside a living organism, right? In part. What about reproduction? Uh, I think it's exclusive to the reproduction. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but how do you define reproduction? Making a copy of itself, right? One cell. Okay, that's a reproduction. Making a copy in itself, right? Okay, so for example, like. If you take crystals, okay, so they also grow. Crystals in a way, nucleus, okay, so if you have a nucleate a crystal, then it takes a copy of itself, okay. So, of course, you can find analogs of these things in, 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 in uh, any of the non living things, okay. So, it was actually, for example, uh, so let's say. Now, of course, it's clear to us 
because we know a lot about at the molecular level what really happens uh, both in test tube and living organisms and, and we know a lot of processes that's affects that but let's say if you go back roughly about 150 years okay so let's say 800 years now okay Imagine most of the methods which we have tools, okay, both chemical tools and physical tools or physics tools which we have today were not really there. Even microscopes were very, very limited, you know. So at that time, people were still thinking, okay, so what is life, you know? So then they said something of vital I think you should all be basically go back and then see. The word vitalism. People thought that okay, living things are different from non-living things. Okay, in living things, whatever occurs, okay, whatever happens in living system is very unique to living systems because it is something called life force. Okay, so which is not present in inorganic substances. Okay, so that's very unique to living system, but they don't know what exactly. Okay, they say it's white. And they had a strong belief that you cannot really do outside okay, what is happening in your body. Okay, so then they thought that living systems are somehow unique. It's, it's basically there is a force in every living entity. So that's why actually it actually does what it does. But you cannot really do this outside the body, outside the living organism. That's the concept of white. Okay. So then uh, people thought, of course, that chemistry was developing and, and uh, observations were getting better and better because then you have microscopes because most of the biology, you know, is basically whatever we know today is because of, mainly because of observation, looking at things at finer and finer scales, okay, using uh, microscopes which are getting better and better today now you can see as small as almost a single molecule in my insect cell. Okay, it's almost like a few tens of nanometers each. You can be able to almost. But of course, if you go to uh, electron microscopes, you can see almost almost a few atoms level and things like that. Okay. But uh, 200 years ago we didn't really have any. Okay, so then they started this white basal concept, means that we cannot really produce anything which is produced in the body. But then everyone actually any textbook. If you go back, they cite this person, polar synthesis, okay? As a chemist, you know this polar, so this basically kind of, you can say, father of modern organic chemistry, okay, where he actually synthesized urea, okay? So urea is typically where in body urea is produced. Do you guys know which organ in our body produces urea? Kidneys, okay. In kidneys, urea is produced, okay. <coughs> so, polar in I think about 1827, okay, 1828, most of the textbooks sign, okay. So, where he synthesized urea using inorganic materials, right. So, urea from I think ammonium cyanide. Okay, of course there is a big debate because ammonium cyanide is not a very stable compound, it's an intermediate in the urea synthesis. So ammonium cyanide dissociates to form urea and ammonium cyanide is, is an inorganic compound and urea is an organic compound. So this was most of the people cite as kind of initial uh, first example where an organic molecule, okay, which is produced in the brain system. In kidneys of multicellular okay, vertebrates, okay, which is produced in the body, was produced in test tube. Okay, so that's when the word more or less coined in vitro. Okay, in glass, basically in test tube. So that was the first example, more or less, people sign and give credit to all the 
But if you open Wikipedia pages and then just see this, there are a couple of other people who, who actually should also get credit. But genius, I think I remember, uh, some other chemists who also have actually uh, synthesized molecules, organic molecules, more or less from inorganic substances. Okay, so that's when actually kind of this word came into existence in vitro means that anything which the process which occurs in living systems, if it is replicated in plants or in test tubes, then you call in vitro. Okay, but if you say if, if the process is as it occurring, okay, inside the cells, then basically in vivo. Okay, in vivo, uh, so basically inside the cells. Okay, but if you ask Mitrade, he will say the word Mitrade, what is the word he will say? In analogous to in vitro, in vivo. With respect to? I mean, kind of words, in vitro is in glass, in vivo is in cells, yeah. in computer simulations. Okay, so it's called in silico. In silico, yeah. Okay, so basically now we can actually replicate these things in computer simulations. So then it's called actually in in in, in silicon. Okay, so uh, so those are the kind of first examples people are actually thinking how to actually replicate things which are how to understand processes which occur in in the body uh, one at a time. Okay, also, and that was the first thing. But still. By 1848, still whiteness is there. People who are adamant in that, no, come on, okay, you really produce one molecule, but right? a lot of other really goes on in the body, right? Definitely. Okay. So then, then another example which people find, okay, in uh, uh, this is that in 1897, okay, so first lecture is going to be kind of introductory and uh, historical. Okay, so then we move to year 1857. Okay, not to far from one yet. Okay, so then uh, I think these two German brothers. Hans, I don't think the last name. The last name is Buckner. Okay. Edward Buckner and Hans Buckner. What they have done is that. So they have taken uh, the residues, okay, which is left in in uh, in uh, when you culture yeast, okay, are basically when extract from yeast. Let me put it like that. Okay, means that broken cells, okay. Means that the cells, cells themselves are not living in the sense that they are not reproducing, uh, reproducible anymore, but they are broken. Means that all the contents inside these living cells are there in this extent, but the cells themselves are not reproducible. Means that they are not really multiplying. Okay, so when they use this, okay, so then uh, they have what they have done is that uh, uh, they could add. Sugar to this, and you know what comes out, right? So, what do you think came off when they added sugar to this? Sugar like the same alcohol, alcohol, all fermentation, it is alcohol, exactly. Alcohol, okay. And uh, the process is fermentation. So this simple extract, okay, means that now the system is not living anymore, but you actually have components of the living system, and then apply that to sugar, you get alcohol. Means that typically the yeast, the living yeast, convert sugar to alcohol, but not only now the living, but broken cells, but the extract, okay, which is inside this, converting sugar to alcohol, means that you don't have to have an entire living thing to replicate processes, okay, which occur in living things. Okay, this is another example. But what you need is that components of those living things. Okay, in this case, of course, you know that there are certain enzymes, okay, which can convert sugar to alcohol. So the enzymes are present both in living yeast, 
but the enzymes are present in uh, this extract. Only thing is that it's not an entire yeast, okay, uh, the yeast cell, uh, not in there. So again shows that, so we have a way of really not understanding what happens inside the cells, inside living systems. We can really replicate these processes one at a time in test tube. If we know what is actually happening, okay, what is responsible for these processes of conversion inside the cell. Okay, for example, in this case, this one. So that's when slowly now, even though people are not satisfied with polar ammonia synthesis. Now they are satisfied that ah, it's not exactly that life force that you don't really need the exact complete living systems, but even decayed systems, okay, which are not living, but however, which have components which are uh, which are present in living systems are enough to actually uh, 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 do these processes outside the cells. So this is kind of part of. Uh, you can say uh, biochemistry. Okay, so looking at uh, processes in living cells called biological processes or biochemical processes, when you are thinking from the chemical point of view. So, can we really understood if we know what are these reactants and what are the uh, molecules which are involved? Then we can actually say this is a kind of work. And then roughly, I mean, then uh, another uh, thing I want to read. So, another later example, almost much later. So, clearly, so this is still, you can really say that extract means that not only just enzymes which are responsible for this, but a lot of other molecules which might not be required for this reaction are there. Okay, so then you don't know exactly which of those. Molecules in the extract are responsible, right? But then in 1926, you know, so this person, Jerry Summer, this client, Julius, this client, from a tree or a duck. Something that means nothing but some kind of variety of let's say plasma. Okay. Uh, the, so he create he purified the enzyme from the beans. Okay, this enzyme is beautiful. You know? So simply now, because now he has the crystals of urease, means that now you know the purified compound. Okay, you have only one type of molecule. So this urease now can be applied to urea, okay? And I think it converts to uh, carbon dioxide. No, sorry, carbon dioxide and ammonia. Okay, of course in one. Okay, so this is kind of now clearly saying is that so to to conduct processes, okay. Which happen inside the body or inside living systems, for example, let's say inside the beans. You don't really need basically material, okay? Uh, you don't really need a barrel implant. So, if you know the substances which are responsible for these reactions, then you can actually use them to conduct this. So, this is really kind of a now advanced level of biochemistry where you are really thinking of in terms of molecules, how exactly. Uh, what they're doing what they're doing. So this brings my, me to uh, this uh, slide. Uh, go back to your uh, 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 slide share PowerPoint. Okay, everyone will see the slide. Some of you tell me what slide actually you're seeing. What, what is the title of the slide? Complexity of life. Complexity of life. <laughs>
So you are muted. Sorry. Yeah. Ah, sorry, sir. Ah, so uh, yeah, I'm muted, right? Uh, yeah, maybe. Okay, so you see beautiful pictures. So this is a good thing about biochemistry and biophysics, where actually you can really see uh, the, all these complexity, but in interesting, colorful pictures. Unlike in mathematics or other theory courses, where actually you don't really get to see this beauty. Okay. So uh, this also makes my life easier because then I can use a lot of pictures. Okay, what you see on the uh, left side is, is a single cell organism called bacterium. Okay, Escherichia coli, uh, coli in short. It's a beautiful uh, cartoon picture, but based on information derived from what we know in the last 15 years. Okay, so this is how actually a bacterium looks like. It's, it has a shape of a rod. Okay, a small capsule, which you can really think of. Of the dimensions of roughly about uh, two micron in length, okay, and about a little less than a micron in diameter. Beautiful rod shape. And these are living things, right? These bacteria actually move in, in, in solution, for example, in liquids, okay, in ponds, or wherever they are, you know, that. And how do they move? They, they need a moving mechanism, right? They don't have uh, legs and hands. Like us, okay, and animals are multicellular, but yet they move, okay. So how do they move? They have actually this uh, flagella. You see it uh, all are actually uh, clump together at the bottom. So this flagella help the bacteria move, okay. Uh, in food, actually, in food uh, gradient, you know, they can actually sense. They are very clever uh, animals. They can actually sense the gradient of glucose, and then they actually move towards uh, the, where actually. The direction of concentration, where the concentration of glucose is high. Okay, and, and the small tiny things which are actually uh, are there on the left and right side, you see beautifully. So they are all called small things are called cilia. Okay, and these cilia are actually helpful uh, in sticking. You know, whether let's say if they form a colony, they can stick to each other. One bacterial cell can stick to another cell. Okay, using this cilia. Ah, sometimes this bacteria can stick to a surface. Okay, that's what actually the CDR. But if you have to move it inside and then see what is at the bottom, okay, on the right side, you see uh, it's an enlarged picture. Okay, these are illustrations by a person called David Kutzer. Okay, from Scripps Institute. You can go to the web and see he's a very fine artist and scientist. Okay, and he makes these beautiful pictures uh, depicting the complexity. Of, of organisms or living systems, you know, how actually molecules move inside the cell and so forth. So this is a kind of coordinate picture, but yet uh, it, the information actually derived from many, many, many experiments. Just to highlight, you can really see at the center of the uh, cell on the right side, uh, you see all these uh, orange strands, uh, okay, uh, which are actually yellow strands, which are DNA. You can really see that these are kind of ropes, okay, and going crisscross, and there are some blobs, okay, inside them. So these blobs actually bind DNA, okay, and uh, they make a copy of uh, DNA, uh, uh, RNA, and uh, these are called DNA polymerases, okay. But if you move slightly outside, so then you see even bigger blobs. These are ribosomes, okay, where actually these strands which are coming out of uh, DNA because of uh, RNA. Polymerase, they, uh, they actually give a small uh, RNA molecules because of the transcription. These molecules enter ribosomes to make uh, the molecules called proteins, which actually carry out most of the function. So the ribosomes themselves consist of both the protein molecules and the variety of uh, RNA molecules. And if you see the cell periphery, Okay, how exactly the flagellum, which you see a big uh, kind of uh, tapes uh, in the outside of the left picture, you can see how it actually is anchored in the cell membrane. You know, it needs to be really anchored rigidly because when the bacteria moves, this flagella should not really come out. Of course, there are many flagella, if just one comes out, it doesn't, it's no harm, but uh, nevertheless, they should really stick, uh, uh, they should really stick uh, nicely without coming out. And also, should, they should actually bear a lot of forces, frictional forces, 
uh, when the bacterium swims in, in let's say in liquids so this flagella are like a whip like molecule you know so they actually uh, they do kind of the flash <laughs> movement and that creates a lot of force okay where they are anchored so the bacteria should really withstand this kind of high forces how they are anchored and how the cell membrane is there how other protein molecules are actually bridging uh, the cell membrane and communicating what's outside and inside and etc so this actually just clearly depicts the complexity of life where of course we can mimic one process at a time in the test tube like you use uh, catalyzing urea to CO2 and NH3 or even make molecules from an organic synthesis but however if you want to really replicate you need to have each and every component of this complex organisms put in place okay both kind of in space and time then only you can be able to do this so this is only just so that you appreciate what's the complexity of the life okay so uh, ah, so and also when it comes to life people also tend to think of course uh, to, to, to 2020 october 14 we know how exactly the living landscape uh, uh, landscape of uh, let's say living things on earth uh, as it appears to but however how do we know that how life really looked in early seven days what, what is the first living organism you know how, how did actually life uh, came into existence okay so uh, obviously there has to be a first living organism right before that it should be something non living how exactly this is realized so people actually try to replicate these experiments you know so in terms of molecules the, the more and more we know okay now so the uh, chemical content of living system okay so then you can you think that okay, what can be the molecules which might give rise to life at this point okay people try to uh, replicate these experiments uh for example like uh, of course we are going to talk about next class on uh so what are the chemical element uh, basically okay so what are the molecules of life okay small as well as large or like molecules but however so these molecules can they be created in in using in conditions okay without using any uh, uh without using any uh, systems for, for example like living so imagine that there is no life So only in our land, let's say Earth form roughly how much? Like 4.5 billion years ago. More or less, actually, life came into existence just after life. You know, just because of the oceans. Okay, that's what uh, the working hypothesis right now is that more or less after Earth came into existence 4.5 billion years ago. So roughly a few hundred million years ago, life began. Obviously, not the complex organisms like us, but mostly single cellular. Okay, so like that 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 brings me back to this previous slide. So where you have the single cell organisms, where actually uh, the entire living thing is just one cell. Okay, bounded by a membrane. So basically, you need to have a, a bounded environment created, uh, for example, by lipids in as a membrane in bacterial system, and everything else which is actually cooking is is contained in this. Okay. So, is it possible that the initial uh, organisms, uh, initial life, can we call primordial life? Is it possible that somehow, by chance, it really occurred? Maybe. Okay. How do we know that? For example, people try to. This is one of the famous experiment, uh, famous experiment by Miller and Urey in the 30s. Okay. So, what they have done is that they recreated the conditions which occurred before the life came into existence. What were those conditions? Lot of lightning, water is there. Okay, oceans are there. Lot of lightning. Okay, uh, and lot of other small molecules are there. Uh, water is there, oceans, and the small molecules like uh, methane, hydrogen, uh, ammonia. So uh, you see, interestingly, all these compounds are made up of very simple elements: okay, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen. Okay, and what you need. The, the kind of reaction as well as the uh, oceans, and then what we need basically some kind of energy, you know. And lightning is actually was that energy. So now, if you replicate that experiment inside the lab, you put all these uh, gases, ammonia, uh, methane, water, H2 inside inside your glass vessel, and then you apply uh, electrodes. 
either light energy or heat energy. And then after some time, if you simply analyze what is there inside this test tube, uh, okay, there's very interesting kind of molecules, including a lot of organic molecules, uh, uh, which might not be really important for the living systems, but molecules which are important for living systems like primitive amino acids like glycine, melanin, are sometimes even nucleosides, you know, so purines and purines. They tend to occur. So, okay, so that came to strength to this hypothesis that maybe the first life, the, the first living molecules, okay, might have formed because of this abiotic conditions of very high temperature and uh, maybe uh, lighting, etc. Okay, so that's why, but, but this by itself is a huge field, okay, because now people are actually looking life beyond uh, our planetary system or beyond solar systems, okay. So where actually, what do they really think about uh, what molecules to look for? You know, very simple, like methane molecule, ammonia molecule, water molecules. If they exist, then more or less we know that it's possible that uh, uh, life uh, exists. Okay, so this brings back me a simple uh, thing. So recently, uh, the, the, in news, okay, so uh, in the Venus, okay, they have actually detected a molecule, okay? So, and based on that, they projected that it's possible that even Venus might have uh, conditions which are appropriate for making molecules and might even be life might be existing. Anyone can guess what is that molecule based on which they use extrapolation uh, because these kind of things, you know, these kind of things are with BBC, News, or Scientific American, uh, Nature of science denial because it's very important because we constantly look uh, uh, like is is it only on Earth is possible or is it possible in other planets or even other solar systems okay uh, or even other galaxies okay which is really beyond okay anyone I, uh, any idea what molecule actually they found on Venus uh, which based on which people thought that there might be phosphine huh phosphine very good. Okay. Pratip, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, phosphate. Peach is a molecule. I know. How did they find some flyby? Uh, basically, because you can't really go there and then see these molecules. Okay. So, most of the time, you use spectroscopy. You know, so basically, spectroscopy is a nice tool uh, where you can really see uh, the vibrations of these bonds or spectral properties. You know, and you may then see these molecules. Like this. You are right. Okay. The first one is a molecule pH3. Uh, based on that, people really extrapolated that yes, Venus might actually have conditions uh, which might uh, be helpful for life. Okay? Because, but if you see the temperature, Venus temperature is much higher than uh, Mars because it's close to the sun. It's close to the sun, obviously it's much warmer. So one would not really think because we are always thinking about mass, right? Because which is uh, which is away from the uh, sun than Earth. So where, of course, we have a lot of exclusions. But why do they think that just based on phosphine? See, now Euler experiments or UV experiments, they found amino acids, right? Then I can imagine amino acids are building blocks of protein molecules. But based on phosphine, how can one actually guess that it's a, it's a light molecule? How does one extrapolate pH three as a chemist to a life as a bacterium? Maybe the phosphine present in the uh, the uh, core shell of the earth or the the uh, stone or the mountain, or from the from the soil the bacteria use them because. No, no. The, the question is that yes, the, the origin of phosphine might be whatever is ocean or mountain or whatever it is. But how a phosphine might be converted to a life molecule or inside life? Which molecules in biological systems have phosphorus? Hydrogen and phosphorus. So the DNA. DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA. Nucleotides. ATP, ATP. Nucleotides. Nucleotides. ATP, DNA, RNA. No? Basically, all these molecules, if you see, phosphate is very, very important. Okay, not phosphate, but of course you can really think of as a chemist. Okay, 
synthesis, how to actually convert phosphine into something. Okay, so these kind of the things actually current work really looking at. So basically, uh, we want to really know the information of each and every molecule, how that has a place both in organic and inorganic world, and uh, how exactly they can actually connect life. Okay, so that's uh, interesting. Good, just you guys got phosphine. Okay, uh, so that's uh, unicellular molecule. Right. Okay, so that itself is a very complex uh, from the chemistry point of view. Imagine uh, in this bacterial cell, what you have is is uh, DNA. Uh, we'll we'll uh, discuss about details of this one. DNA, RNA, enzymes like DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase, which uh, bind DNA and and produce uh, products like uh, other RNAs and, and uh, protein molecules in combination with other machines like ribosomes and then utilize these molecules for the survival and movement okay and replication okay so uh, but however uh, when it comes to the multicellular systems where actually life consists of not just one molecule yes. Yeah. Life consists of more than one cell, for example, like us. Okay, uh, it's much more complicated. Okay, complex than uh, than bacteria. Okay, but again, coming back to just to summarize, what's how do you define uh, living system and non living system? So, living systems are, of course, all all the points pointers are correct: metabolism, uh, growth, replication. Uh, uh, reproduction, okay, uh, taking energy, okay, from environment, constant input of energy, okay, that's basically of course it comes to constant input of energy, okay, so this energy for us, for example, food, okay. Uh, but plants, other living systems, where actually we need some light, are photons. Okay, so this is constantly given. Okay, if we don't take food, if we don't take food, we don't have energy. We know what really happens, right? So living systems have a constant input of energy, and that energy is utilized. Okay. For to do all these processes, growth, replication, reproduction, metabolites, and etc. 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 So if you see, but any one point of time, okay, for example, let's say, especially when really grown up, okay, more or less, this is called after the development. So typically it's divided into developmental stage and then adult stage. Let's say either bacterium, let's say one it is grown completely. Okay, are uh, for example multicellular organisms once 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 uh, once they're grown up, you know, more or less you don't have you don't have major changes from being okay or even big. Okay, so this is called chemical compound. Okay. I mean, there is very little on an average, okay, from day to day in living things. For example, like my body weight doesn't really change a lot, okay, even in day, weeks, etc. Okay, as long as, okay, I take food, I take that energy, that energy right? But however, so what's really happening is constant input of energy. So this input of energy is used to do something. But yet, more or less, my state, okay? Is more or less the same, okay? So this kind of state is constant. So this you can really call steady state. Okay? Means that, how do you define steady state as a chemist? A state in which things when you watch just from outside 
things don't seem very different. They are more or less the same. For example, like on an average, my chemical composition is not drastically different. Okay, in a week, in a day, or in a day. So this is statistic. But however, in chemistry, you know two kinds of statistics. Right? One is static, another is dynamic. Static means that things are not really changing anything. They are there. Nothing is really happening. Okay, if you have a bunch of molecules in a test tube, they are sitting there. Nothing really is changing. So dynamic statistics. Okay, means things are really happening. It's not that nothing is happening. A lot of things are happening, but more or less uh, the, the composition is not changing. Okay, so you put something in, you put something out. Okay, very simple example. Uh, you have blood, right, in our blood body. Okay, blood consists of what are called uh, one of the important components of blood is RBCs, red blood cells. Okay, so more or less you have a certain amount of blood. That amount is constant. Okay, it doesn't really drastically change over time. The amount of blood I'm talking, and also the number of RBCs, red blood cells. But however, if you compare exactly after four months, okay, and then ask your RBCs. Those RBCs of today are completely different from the RBCs which you have after 120 days. Okay, so RBCs lifetime is 120 days. More or less after 120 days, each RBC actually dies. A new red blood cells. Okay, so in that sense, you have a dynamic statistic. Okay, okay, this is true for some of the molecules inside the cell. Of course, some molecules are actually kind of permanent. Okay, for example, if you see your eye lens, okay, through the organ which you see, okay, the lens in eye, there is a protein called crystalline, okay, so this lens crystalline more or less, they are with you, okay, almost from your birth to much, much, much later days. So the lifetime of this molecule is much larger, okay? But molecules like RBCs, okay, are white blood cells, okay, anything circulation system, the life is too short, okay? So in that sense, we have a dynamic steady state where things are actually changing because you are pumping energy and and what is called maintaining order. Okay, so living systems are dynamic, exist in steady state, they need constant input of energy. Okay, so without this, they cannot really survive, they cannot exist. Okay, they die. And maintaining order. So that's what I'm talking about the chemical composition order. Okay. So this brings basically kind of thermodynamics point of view. Okay. According to thermodynamics, so things eventually reach equilibrium. Okay. So you have open systems, closed systems, and isolated systems. Okay. So what do you think? Uh, living things are living systems. Interesting. Close, open, isolated. Living systems. Yes. Open system. Open system. Open system. Open system. Open system. system. Cause. So they exchange not only energy, but they exchange matter as well. Because we take food, means that that's basically material, okay? And also we give up a lot of heat, okay? So we are constant in touch with surroundings, okay? 
So constant in touch with continually interacting. With surroundings. Okay. But however, uh, so we are not uh, living this point. Okay. Uh, one way to say is the dynamic steady state, another way to say is that non equilibrium. Okay, we are never really at equilibrium because we are constantly pumping energy, okay, driving against Okay, so uh, we are the non equilibrium systems, we are never really equilibrium. Okay, and uh, so, but maintaining order, right? Non equilibrium, but order. But this goes against the uh, second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so we just our systems. Okay, so we actually we are increasing order, are maintaining order. So obviously. Second law of thermodynamics says that if the systems are more disordered, that's actually more stable state. But however, so the total entropy of the universe increases, there's no question about it. But locally, okay, so things like living systems maintain order. For example, like in this bacterial cell, it orders the membrane, it uh, bonds the molecules, it creates an environment. That's highly ordered state compared to, for example, if you break open bacterium, everything is scattered. Okay. So, but how this happens? So, why we can actually maintain the order? Because we are putting energy from outside. As long as we put energy from outside, okay, so we can really be at non equilibrium, we can have order. Okay. So, it's not that against the second law of thermodynamic, but it's only locally. But the entropy of the entire system really is uh, increased. So we have to keep in mind. Okay. So, uh, like I said, so the single cellular organisms themselves are very complex. But when it comes to the multicellular organisms. Sir, 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 I have a question. Yes, sir. sir, I have a question. Sir, when we are taking energy from outside, then we are maintaining our, our order. So, how the say, total entropy of the system is increasing? Total for any spontaneous process, the total entropy of the universe is always increasing. So when we are taking energy from outside, we are maintaining our order. So how the total entropy of the system is increasing? It is not understood. How the total entropy of the system? Hmm. Okay, so but we are emitting heat as well, right? That actually yes, changes the outside much more, you know. So of course we consume food energy, okay? But then yes, we give out a lot of heat. Right, yes, yes. that yes. It actually makes the say, things outside disorder. Okay. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Yeah. But imagine if we have an isolated system, then it would be a problem. Of course, living things cannot be isolated because we need to exchange both the matter, uh, matter and energy. It can't be even so because we need to exchange between. Them. Okay, that uh, clarifies. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So uh, the question is that. Multicellular organisms, you know, they are even more complex. Okay, so then it comes what's called the specialization. Okay, 
So because cellular cells, okay, multi cellular. So, life like bacterium, single cells. So, if you take one bacterium versus another bacterium, all of them consist of just single cells. Okay, so all of them are again. Uh, because they contain only one cell. It's not the, 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 the different cells types doesn't even arise because the entire life is one cell. But multicellular organisms like animals, okay, like us, plants, okay. So now you have, can we have all cells identical to each other? Then it's basically kind of bunch of cells, okay? So is it possible what will happen, okay? So the question is that, so we have evolved, okay? So so we have been evolved from Unicellular organisms okay, through evolution to increase the complexity. Okay, so that complexity comes with some benefits. For example, like bacterial cell, it cannot really uh, move, let's say, meters or kilometers, right? But multicellular organisms like us, we can actually move, okay, over large distances. That's a big advantage. Okay, so the, what is the advantage? You can actually now go to different places of food. Imagine a bacterium, okay, in a pond. Somehow it doesn't have its own food, it dies, right? But imagine there's a food only few meters away. Now this bacterium cannot really go there. But multicellular systems can really go. So that's added advantage, okay? But the thing is that with this added advantage, so you have to really build in that. Okay, how do exactly a bunch of bacterial cells? cannot really make a multicellular organisms because all of them exist independent. But in multicellular organisms, so which consists of many cells, so they have to communicate, they have to talk to each other, okay? But can they be all, all identical? It looks like not. So then it will be a bunch of organisms, a colonies we call, you know? So then that will not suffice. So then you have to have much more than what individual cells can be provide. So that's when actually our cells now, okay, divide into different types of cells called tissues. For example, like your lung tissue is different from, okay, your blood is considered a tissue, okay, because it has cells. Blood tissue is different from your brain tissue, okay, versus uh, your gut tissue or the liver tissue. Means that every part in your body is made up of cells, but the architecture is very similar between most of the cells, all of cells like in bacterial cells, what I have shown, you have uh, DNA, you have uh, molecules which make uh, RNA, um, called multiplies DNA, makes protein molecules, etc, etc. That overall architecture is same, but yet these organs, cells are different. So this is called the tissues. So this is happens a process called differentiation. You know? So, specialized cell through differentiation. Okay, so this is a kind of very specialized topic by itself in the development of biology, where you can really think of that how cells initially similar to each other, called stem cells, means they are identical to each other. They can really become uh, a blood cell, or a nerve cell, or a gut cell, or a liver cell. But however, after certain uh, processes are inside the cells, now they are already designed to become one type of tissue. Okay, there are some molecular level changes in these cells. Make them a specialized cells called tissue cells. Okay, we are not really going to the details. But to uh, uh, give the importance, okay, so how we need uh, a specialized cells, okay, specialized uh, ways of conducting processes. For example, like 
Let's start with one example. So you have a lot of bacteria. Means that they take oxygen from environment, okay, and other food from environment, and conducts its life process. We also, okay, so we also, for example, as the animals, also use oxygen, okay, right? But what is the main difference? How do we get our oxygen and how do bacteria get their oxygen? They, they perform cellular respiration. Uh, Suman, you are saying that we get oxygen from cellular respiration. No, bacteria. Actually, uh, they, for, uh, they get oxygen in either in soluble form, they don't take it in gaseous form. Okay, so but oxygen is either if they are swimming in water, then water uh, oxygen is dissolved in water. We have a developed system so we, for. So we, we have specialized organs All which are yes. supposed to take in the oxygen for bacteria. It's simple diffusion that takes place. But yeah, one difference is of course bacteria. They're not well. There are airborne bacteria. You know, so they can live in short span of time, but not for a long time. Uh, yes, oxygen in water dissolved oxygen they are taking. How we are taking directly from here? But you can think of fish. Fish, you know, they don't even take uh, oxygen from uh, air, right? Uh, from the soil blocks. Okay. So the, the main difference is that a bacteria just takes oxygen from outside its environment. Okay, through what is called diffusion. Means that an oxygen molecule is outside the bacteria, which can diffuse through through its membrane, shown in this picture. To inside, okay, wherever then this oxygen is uh, required, it's available, right? And if you see the dimensions of bacteria, okay, so it's roughly about two micron in uh, length, and it's about less than a micron in diameter, okay. So now oxygen it is just outside. This so this can simply diffuse through okay through membrane over a distance of micron. Okay, so now it doesn't have any special machinery inside the bacteria to say that okay, I need to really capture this oxygen because I'm not going to get another oxygen molecule long. It doesn't even bother. Okay, but however, for us, okay. So now, what are the dimensions of a human being, you know? Okay. Roughly high. Okay. Meters. Okay. So we have the dimensions of meters, you know? Okay. Or even if you take my hand, dimensions of let's say five centimeters, okay, or ten centimeters diameter. Okay, means that of course we also have oxygen around us, right? How much? Twenty percent oxygen around us, okay, uh, of air, lot of oxygen. But the thing is that oxygen actually going to your hand, but however, it will reach only the cells which are at the surface. Okay, like bacteria, if it's only micron thick, you don't really require oxygen is actually going. But imagine a tissue where even if it is few millimeters from the surface, okay, from my skin, those cells will not get oxygen because all the oxygen is actually absorbed by the top layer. Right? So now I cannot rely on my entire body taking oxygen from through diffusion, okay? So then you need diffusion, no way you can Okay, so then you need to have active, actively you have to see, and then say that 
I need to really capture oxygen, okay, inside the body somehow. Okay, so these multicellular organisms have their blood. Okay, so that's the tissue is blood. Okay, so blood tissue. Okay, has been developed to circulate oxygen throughout the body. Okay, of course, then we have developed lungs. That's where actually oxygen is captured. Lungs plus oxygen. Okay, so active. Okay, so bacteria simply they are diffusion. They don't have any special machinery, so they don't require that blood. They don't require lungs. Especially two tissues are gone, right, from their tissue list. But for us, so we need to capture. Means that now we have evolved to have lungs. That's where actually the oxygen is captured. That's first part. Next, capturing is not uh, only uh, sufficient, right? You need to have mechanism to transport this throughout the body. So that's where actually the circulatory system. Okay. So in addition to very different circulatory systems, we have blood. Okay, where actually we transport uh, this. So this is one of the key elements we actually discuss uh, when it comes to really uh, allostery, etc. Where actually how myoglobin versus hemoglobin. Uh, what are the differences? Okay. So why we have two different types of oxygen capture molecules you know so how exactly they perfect fun perfectly function inside the body because imagine if you capture means something binds strongly right but if it binds too strongly then then it will not release right so we have to have kind of intermediate level we need to not only capture strongly but we also have to release strong okay so this is basically my global hemoglobin system beautifully works and the allosteric actually plays a really important yes sir so uh, we can control and measure the how much we take or uptake but uh, in case of bacteria how they control that uh, how much oxygen they needed very simple right i mean you see they don't require oxygen is actually going to diffuse through oh <laughs> imagine and, uh, oxygen is actually passing through the bacteria the oxygen is not to uh, capture or absorb okay it will go out of the bacteria it doesn't even care and like oxygen like any gas like nitrogen argon uh, carbon dioxide all okay. can pass through all, all the gases molecules which are i mean which can be small molecules okay which can diffuse through membranes they do definitely nitrogen is not so it's no harm okay and argon is only 1% or other things are also very small but all these small gases actually uh, uh, pass through cells Okay, uh, and only thing is that if it is required, it will capture. If not, it will not. But in our case, actively we have to really capture and circulate. So this actually exemplifies why we have the different types of uh, cells. Okay, all cells at the heart very similar. They have DNA, similar protein machinery, etc., etc. But yeah, they are different functions. Okay, that so, makes actually us different so from. Actually, uh, so to the cells which are onto our surface which are not deep in, seated into the tissues okay. are in our body uh, so are they also exposed to different gases and they allow the transport of the gases because yes. uh, so basically all our skin cells so we don't have any uh, any uh, blocking here that we say that of okay, no oxygen reflected back no i think all these gases actually pass through your uh, membranes cells okay so you don't have any control but the thing is that it's very tiny amount which is actually going to okay and nitrogen anyway not doesn't react okay and the uh, oxygen actually going through your to top to the uh, cells okay imagine like your fruits when we say why fruits for example like if you have apple if you cut it after few seconds you see that it's like white becomes brown right okay right? so because oxygen actually simply diffuse you have reacting with those oxidizing okay but of course we have the uh, that problem but the thing is that this is where actually brings about the chemical components of our life tells uh, what happens if we have too much oxygen you know i mean everything is actually becoming oxidized right so then you have to actually control that 
Yes. Sir, actually, I've studied the selective permeability of the membranes onto either the microbes or to our on cell, uh, our cells. So, what does that do? Actually, the selective permeability of the membranes doesn't they allow the gases? Oh, sorry, doesn't they inhibit the gases from entering out cells? No, no, no. I think gases. See, if you take the gases in air, oxygen, nitrogen, argon, they're actually passing through your membrane. Membranes, they diffuse very easy. Okay. So, so very easy, very easy for me to, yes. sir, one question. So, sir, can so, we like? So, so, much. so it's basically the membrane, you know, more or less. The so, coli membranes are very similar to the our membrane. It's not crashed very different, you know. So, they have the little molecules, bunch of proteins. Oh, our cell walls are exactly the same, even plant cell walls, you know. And so these small molecules, oxygen is such a tiny molecule, which can actually be used through these membranes where there is no block. Okay, it's not reflected back at the membrane. Okay. Yeah, Prati. So sir, like we uh, put some medicine or other like in uh, through syringe in our blood cell. So in that uh, we can uh, take oxygen Why? and put uh, through the blood cell like in the tissue. Like the syringe or any other process. That no. is, we can we can put the oxygen in the blood and it can go circulate through the whole the body. No, but also it's going to come out. No, I didn't understand your concept clearly. You were saying that we inject oxygen through syringe. Well, syringe, on any any like device that can put like those we put some uh, medicine or through the blood circulation. The, mm -hmm. any vaccine so that well, that way we can put uh, uh, through any device the oxygen and the cell or blood blood that takes the oxygen and circulate that possible no 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 so what you're talking about just pumping directly oxygen gas into let's say blood vessels is it correct yes yes yeah no that will create other problems so let's say if you have accumulated gas then it will appear as a bubble you know i mean you, you know why someone when gives injection they are very careful about avoiding air bubbles in that okay so it creates actually blocks because our capillaries are the dimensions of few micron in diameter okay imagine let's say if you have air bubble means what is air bubble a lot of gas okay accumulated concentrated okay so now all this is not absorbed. If it is absorbed, then it's not air bubble anymore. All right? Okay. But okay. the thing is that if this accumulate is a bubble that creates a problem for the circulation system. Imagine, let's say, if you have a, a pump. Okay. So sometimes I don't know if you guys face. You know, we used to do this when we were you know, children. You know, the water doesn't really come. You know, well, you have to do a lot of uh, things. But sometimes there is a block of air bubble, etc., etc. You know, so that creates actually. A uh, smooth movement of liquid through capillaries. So there's no way we can really uh, can do that. Uh, but for example, like if someone cannot breathe normally, then you have artificial uh, machines, you know, uh, which actually lung machines. You know, so people, for example, like in the COVID pandemic, people uh, so whose lungs are not really efficient, you know, so you have actually breathing machines. Where actually again just you pump oxygen only to the lungs, you provide. But again, the hemoglobin needs to capture and then circulate to all the tissues inside the body, okay, without fail. Uh, because every cell in the body requires oxygen, without which you cannot be. Okay, so the concepts which you are going to learn in the course are you know, structure and organization uh, in terms of small molecules and large molecules or macro molecules, what are important molecules. That brings back me to uh, okay. so this line. Okay. So I then end up with this line. Okay. So if you see uh, what you see on my slide is a uh, uh, molecular component of a cell. Okay. So this is a bacterial cell, but more or less true for any biological cells. Okay. So most of the cell by weight, okay, is made of just water. Okay, water is a basically reaction vessel. Okay, so solve. So in this 70% weight of cell in water, the remaining 30% is actually 
uh, divided into all other chemical components of the you know, cell. Okay, out of those, uh, roughly half of the non aqueous uh, weight is coming from proteins. So that's why we call actually proteins are the machines, okay, molecular machines are the work parts of life. Okay, so. So proteins are so important because of almost every process you can really think of inside the cell, somewhere the protein is there, along with other molecules. Okay. So these are molecular machines. Okay, sometimes I like to call them good process. Because all the work is done by them. Okay. Uh, of course, there are work horses and molecular machines, but every cell needs to know that which proteins to be made and how much they need to be made. Uh, when they are made already, they are activated or not. Okay, all these are uh, questions which are important for proteins. So, which proteins need to be made uh, are decided by the uh, genome. Okay. Uh, consisting the information consisting in DNA. Okay, so that DNA translates the information, or sometimes we call the carbon copy, you know, uh, to replicate another cell or within the cell, what uh, within the cell to carry out all the important process. So if you see the DNA, uh, so there are two columns here one is weight, another is number of different types of molecules, okay, different molecules. So there are, at a time you are saying that 3,000 different types of protein molecules exist at any point of time. But the DNA, if you see only one, because you see only one chromosome set. Okay, so you have basically one copy. And of course there are a lot of RNA molecules, okay, which are again floating around the cell, which are information in between DNA and protein molecules. And along with other major important molecules are uh, polysaccharides and lipids. Okay, so these proteins, nucleic acids, in terms of DNA, RNA, polysaccharides, come in the form of uh, macromolecules or biomacromolecules. Means these are large molecules made from small entities. Again, going opposite to the second law of thermodynamics, that's why you need a lot of energy because your order, when you create the sequence, that's an order sequence. You know? So that's not a random sequence. So you require energy. So, and again, you need lipids mostly to uh, create the boundary of each cells. And also, when it comes to uh, the eukaryotic cells, just like you want to reach a previous slide of this. Okay, so lipids not only create boundary for the outside, but also uh, boundaries for organelles inside the cell. Okay, and a lot of other small molecules we call metabolites, ATP, ADP. Okay, AMP, whatever you name it, a lot of other molecules, NADP, NADP, a lot of other molecules are actually important. In addition to ions, okay, for example, like uh, magnesium, zinc, chloride, sodium, potassium, all these are very important. Okay, so I'll just one slide, one last thing before we uh, end this class is that so the complexity of uh, eukaryotic cell uh, in respect to in respect to the prokaryotic cell. So in prokaryotic cell, all the information, chemical content is actually within one cell without any specific boundary. You have a nucleus, uh, you have a nucleus, you don't have a specific boundary, it's called nucleoloid. And, and then all other protein molecules, solvent ions, everything in one, bounded in one compartment. But when it comes to eukaryotic cells, the bound, they, they are, it's compartmentalized, for different reasons, because it's like a factory. Okay, uh, imagine it's like a, a factory of a car versus factory of a bicycle. You know, so in bicycle, of course, it's complex enough. You need wheels, you need handle, you need uh, uh, belts, chain, etc. But when it comes to cars, you need much more complex uh, elements. Okay, so imagine you know, the bacterial cell is a factory of cycle, but your eukaryotic cell is as a factory of um, automobile. So basically, so then you need to really organize and efficiently streamline uh, from the production of, uh, uh, for example, like basic frame, okay, of the car, 
the final engine checking. You know, you need to have the process needs to be streamlined, assembly, okay, finally, so that we deliver. Similarly, if our excels because of this compartmentalization, the process actually information goes from inside the cell to outside. Okay, I just label a couple of things. So everyone is seeing my slide, right? Okay, so just focus on only on the top four annual cell. So what we have in the center is the nucleus and the nucleolus. Okay, so there is a specific difference between nucleus and nucleolus. Nucleolus is where actually uh, regular, uh, regular RNA synthesized. And outside that, uh, the DNA is in the form of chromosomes where actually information is transcribed into RNAs. So immediately after the nucleus, you have the endoplasmic reticulum where actually the RNAs, okay, coming from DNA, need to be now bound to ribosomes to create uh, proteins in this rough endoplasmic reticulum. So when it goes down to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, where actually you can have uh, uh, molecules of lipid synthesis, you know, and if you go down, then you have Golgi apparatus where actually the protein molecules which are synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum are transported. Some needs to really go to the cell membrane, some needs to go to different parts of the cell. So where actually the packaging and uh, uh, also sometimes carboxylation, uh, you want the actual molecule that's really happening. So other important compartments are mitochondria. So for example, the energy is required. Right? Um, uh, so how exactly uh, our energy, which we take as a food, for example, like glucose, it converted into useful energy. Okay, useful energy is basically ATP. Okay, so basically you can really call mitochondria as powerhouses, or you can really say ATMs of cells, where actually they can stick out ATP as the currency, you know. And a lot of other uh, things are also important. For example, like how do you recycle waste? You have a dustbin in your room, right? Cells also have actually their dustbins, like lysosomes, where actually unwanted protein molecules are actually shipped and then all are destroyed into small uh, fragments, which can then be recycled and used back. And you have peroxisomes, where actually specialized compartments, where actually oxidation really occurs, for example, like fatty acids in this case. Okay, so I want you to actually read uh, uh, this slide and the previous slide, uh, this one, uh, bacterial cell, carefully because next class uh, we will have like five minute quiz. Then uh, I'll ask each organelle in this cell roughly what is the function, what does it do, nucleolus, what does it do, mitochondria, what does it do. Okay, so read carefully. So, more or less, what I spoke today, uh, I have taken from this principles of biochemistry literature, first chapter. Beautiful, it's easy to read. I would recommend basically reading, you know. And, there, and also, there are very nice end of the uh, chapter exercises, you know. For example, you should really read. For example, like one important question I'll give you, okay? So, our life is based on uh, carbon. One important property of carbon are which uh, separates carbon from other elements is the contamination. We say that carbon can form chains of molecules. Silicon can also form chains of molecules, okay? But somehow we don't have life yet. We have not seen, okay? Based on silicon, okay? So think about, okay? So you read about this and the next time, let me see who will answer that, okay? Why can't we have silicon-based life similar to carbon-based life? Because carbon and silicon share exactly chemical, similar chemical reactivity and uh, properties like especially forming long chains, that's what is actually important because the important molecules in, in, in our life are proteins, DNA, RNA, uh, polysaccharides, all actually can form uh, small molecules called monomers uh, going to polymers. Okay, silicon also can do that, but somehow we don't have. So to bring about some arguments why uh, we don't have, what might be the reason. I think that ends so lecture one and uh, so I'll, I'll give this uh, uh, lineage of uh, I mean PDF file to Aditya I'll forward it to you and uh, this lecture we are recording so we'll save it somewhere if some guys require later then you can do it okay and uh, this powerpoint slides also I'll forward it to you okay so next class will be on uh, uh, Friday okay thank you any questions? I think it's already long time. Oh. So I have a question. Yes, yeah, so I have a question. Yeah. 
Yeah. So regarding that diffusion of gases, I think there is some parcels playing role in the absorption of uh, gases. What uh, Pratip and Suman said. Pusha, did you say that phosphine? I didn't understand. Could you repeat? No, no. That no, no. Regarding that diffusion of gases uh, in animal cells. Yeah. yeah. Diffusion of gases in animal cells. Okay. I, I think that partial pressure is playing some role. Partial pressure is playing some role in absorption of the gases. Partial pressure of gases is playing some important role. Uh, how? How it might be playing an important role? But I cannot hear you. Maybe he's referring to the pressure so, uh, inside inside our the, body. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Yes, so that uh, somehow some somehow oxygen is binding at uh, 100 mm of Hg is part of that partial pressure uh, when it binds to hemoglobin or some things I have read in biology. I think that might be playing some role that other gases do not. No, no, no. no. It's nothing to do with that because hemoglobin is very. I mean, hemoglobin is specific to two molecules. Uh, oxygen, O2, bimolecular oxygen or dioxygen, and CO2. It also binds CO2, and of course, it binds CO as well. That's very important. Okay, so only these three molecules. It doesn't bind like N2 or R. So then there's no partial pressure to push. Right? But of course, it's important that, it's important that how exactly why it binds oxygen in lungs and then releases oxygen in, let's say, tissues. Uh, that is an important aspect one needs to really, it's not purely, uh, uh, well, pressure, amount of gas is important, but more important concept is uh, allosteric that we will discuss. Allosteric is a deciding factor, uh, in addition to, of course, how much oxygen is available, but it's nothing to do with uh, other gases. You know, it doesn't really bother about how much energy is there. But of course, it bothers about how much CO and CO2 is. Okay, because in uh, tissues, we have a lot of CO2. So it brings back CO2. That's a good thing about hemoglobin. So it not only carries oxygen, it carries back carbon dioxide. Okay, that we'll talk about when we discuss about uh, the concept of allosteric, which is a very important regulatory mechanism by which proteins actually control the process of synthesis. Okay, so any other short questions if you have? Oh. Yeah, one, th one thing more, yeah, regarding the steady state. Yeah. Regarding the steady state. Yeah. Then so suppose I have, uh, uh, I, I have a hormonal imbalance in my body and uh, suppose the, a particular hormone has fluctuating composition in my body for a certain duration of time. Okay. So is still steady state valid at, uh, during that uh, time or not? I didn't understand. You said the hormonal imbalance, but I didn't follow after that. What did you say? Tushar, could you repeat that last? So part? basically, I was telling that suppose I have uh, a hormonal. So uh, uh, will steady state be validated if I had a fluctuating hormonal condition in my body for a certain okay. period of time? Ah, I don't get it. Okay. So does that constitute a steady state? Okay. So when we say this word, the steady state, like I said, even the chemical composition, right? I said that chemical composition more or less the same uh, but today uh, versus tomorrow versus the day after. But if you have to really count and enumerate the molecules, number of molecules, then it's not accurate, in sense, right? For example, like, of course, immediately after I have food, I have more glucose. But the thing is that if I'm starved for, let's say, one and a half hour, then I don't have glucose, right? So in that sense, it's not strict, but more or less, it's out of billions of molecules which constitute in our body. You know, very small fractions. Of that. So that's what we mean by steady state. Okay, but this is different during the development. For example, let's say life begins at zygote. Okay, uh, one cell divides to two, two cells to four, etc. At that stage, things are actually changing very rapidly. That's called developmental stage. But once the development is complete, okay. So then, it's, for example, it's called adult stage, where no more the, the, the big developments really happen. But at the time, only I'm just taking uh, energy from 
environment and then uh, keeping my ordered state okay and working again second law of thermodynamics so if i don't take food then you will disintegrate and disorder will increase and second law of thermodynamics okay uh, that's this and one final question uh, so we talked about initially what is life how do you define living systems right so in this covid pandemic you know corona virus right so next time i mean we will talk about couple of questions uh, come up with some logical explanations corona virus is it living or non living okay so think about it okay so next class we'll talk about beginning uh, silicon based life versus uh, uh, and uh, uh, corona virus is living or not and uh, quickly we will basically ask a quick quiz on what are these uh, different components of this cell okay and roughly what is the function of different organs okay so see you on uh, friday okay bye bye thank you okay bye and mr deep and anyone who is on campus can actually come in kg that will be easier okay yeah. okay okay bye bye